morning. Good morning. All right, welcome back. Uh, my name is Vince Houghton. I'm the historian and curator here at the International Spy Museum. Uh, you should know be my now. So we are now on our fourth and final week of this spring Smithsonian series. Um, is that better? Okay. Uh, and, and although we won't be able to see each other again after this week, that's not necessarily true. We have a lot of great programming coming up, as I've told you several times. We do have uh, our spring communique out uh, first time last week. So the one, if you picked up one the first week, this one's different, tells you everything going up until the very beginning of the summer. So a lot of possible chances for us to spend more time together, uh, which we're all looking forward to. This being our final time, we'd like to thank the Smithsonian Associates for everything they've done organizing uh, these events. Uh, we, we've worked with them now for several years and we continue to look forward to working with them in the future. Of course, we'd like to thank Stephen Budiansky, Steve Vogel, and Christy McCrackus uh, for taking the time to come uh, and speak to all of you. Um, we are hard at work. Uh, Man Oki in the back, who you may know, uh, our director of adult programming is working hard on coming up with what will be the fall series. Uh, so keep the lookout. Uh, it won't be any time soon, soon, uh, but in the next couple months-ish, before the end of the spring, there should be a, uh, an announcement about what the fall series will look like and the kind of speakers. Uh, we always have fun putting these together and trying to figure out ways to link things and get good speakers, so the fall should be no different than that. So we introduce our speaker today, uh, Susan Landau, who is the bridge professor in the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and the School of Engineering at the Department of Computer Science at Tufts University, and a visiting professor in computer science at the University College in London. Her new book, which is this, Listening In, Cybersecurity and Insecure Age, was just published last November by MIT Press. Yeah. No, Yale University yeah. Press. All the other ones are MIT Press. Right. That's why I should read. Uh, <laughs> She's also the author of Surveillance of Security, The Risk Posed by New Wiretapping Technologies, and the co-author with Whitfield Duffy, Diffy, of Privacy on the Line, the Politics of Wiretapping and Encryption. That's where the MIT Press stuff comes in. She has testified before Congress, most notably regarding the FBI versus Apple case. Written for the Washington Post, Science and Scientific American, and frequently appears on NPR and BBC. Dr. Landau has been a senior staff privacy analyst at Google a distinguished engineer at Sun Microsystems and a faculty member at Worcestershire Polytech Institute, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and Wesleyan University. She was inducted into the Cybersecurity Hall of Fame in 2015. And for me, in the nerd universe that I live in, the coolest thing is she even has an algorithm named after her <laughs> in mathematics, which, you know, for space people, it's about a planet or an asteroid. For mathematicians, having an algorithm named after them is pretty cool. So without further ado, Dr. Susan Landau. Thank you. So I'm here because of Apple, although in some sense, uh, not in some sense, the story started many years before that. But Apple really brought it to the forefront. And what happened, if I can get this to not move too quickly, what happened, of course, is that in, um, there was the terrorist activity at San Bernardino, the San Bernardino holiday party, in which two people, a married couple, one of whom who worked at San Bernardino um, at the health department, came in with rifles, uh, killed 14 people, injured scored as others. They had pipe bombs that didn't explode. Then they went off in their rented black suburban. They, the police caught up with them a few hours later. Uh, they were killed in the shootout. Uh, they had destroyed their computers and their personal phones. But uh, one of them had a phone that belonged to the San Bernardino Health Department, an iPhone, and it was locked, and law enforcement wanted to get in. Now, at this point, Apple had put in security protections into the phone. And the security protections consisted of you had to use a pin to get in. Um, you had 10 tries with the pin. And if after 10 tries you weren't able to open the phone, the data was erased. Um, not only that, it slowed down between the tries. So there was a little bit of time between the first and the second try, more time between the second and the third, twice as much between the third and the fourth, and so on. So it made it not easy to do. The FBI went to Apple and said, undo your security protections. They said, write a software update to the phone that undoes those, those protections and actually also enables us to try things in bulk, to try all possible pins in bulk. And Apple said no. 
Um, Apple said no on two bases. The first one was that they said that the government was over applying something called the All, All Writs Act, which is a law from the, the 1700s that says that business, that companies must help uh, Law, must help the government when government is doing an investigation. It never said to what extent government, the companies must help. There was a case back um, that went to the Supreme Court, New York Telephone, that said, yes, the telephone company had to give information to law enforcement. But this was different because, as Apple said in later filings, it would take them between two and four weeks with between six and nine engineers working on the system to do that update. That was one piece of it. The other piece of it was about security. And what Apple said, and here I'm very pleased because I was the one pushing this argument, Apple said that, that it would create security problems. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. So uh, during this, this whole battle, FBI kept saying, only Apple can open the phone. The only way the phone can be unlocked is if Apple creates an update that will unlock the phone. I was teaching one day at Worcester Polytech, and despite the fact that it's spelled W-O-R-C-E-S-T-E-R, -E -E it's Worcester. <laughs> uh, uh, it's one of those oddities of Massachusetts. We have many oddities there, but that's one of them. Um, I was teaching one night at, uh, at Worcester Polytech, and uh, it was a three-hour class. I would take a break in the middle. I looked at my mail, and there was mail from uh, The Guardian, and they said, uh, FBI can open the phone. Did you do it? I wrote, no. <laughs> I do. I do security stuff, but I don't, I don't hack. This is not my set of expertise. Then I got, what do you think about it? So I wrote something short. They said, can we interview? I said, no, I'm teaching. I'll write back later. Then I wrote back later. And then they quoted me. But, but the point was uh, not what The Guardian had to say, but the fact that, that the FBI had been arguing that only Apple could open the phone, and the only way to open the phone was by putting in this update. And what happened, as has happened repeatedly, is in fact there were vulnerabilities in the system that Apple had used to, to lock the phone. Big software is hard to write. All of you know this because all of you know that you are constantly updating your devices because somebody finds a bug. All of you know about things like the government using hacks to get into systems in various ways. So the point was that the FBI was wrong. They were able to get into the phone. Um, it was not a surprise to many people that they didn't find a whole lot of evidence on the phone. Um, the, they had said maybe they there was an 18 minute gap. For this audience, I don't have to tell you how funny it is that it's 18 minutes. You know, I teach this to undergraduates and they don't laugh. Um, uh, but, but the point was that they were talking about who else had the, had the terrorists communicated with in that gap where they didn't know where they were. If they had communicated with anybody else, there would have been trails in the cell towers, there would have been trails at the ISPs, and there weren't. So the only information they got off the phone is that they didn't communicate with anybody. That's not useless information, but it was probably not worth the close to a million dollars that the FBI spent on it. Um, and so what this is about is really about eavesdropping, and it's an argument that's been going on for about 40 years now. It started with telephones, and now it's moved to uh, smartphones. There's a big difference between the two arguments. The first argument on telephones is really about the ability of law enforcement to listen in to communications that are encrypted end to end. So there is a communication key, there's an algorithm and a key. Let me briefly talk. I assume that some of you are actually very sophisticated about crypto, and some of you are not. So let me very briefly talk about cryptography. Cryptography has two aspects. Encryption has two aspects. It has an algorithm. It has a key. Let me give you some simple algorithms. First algorithm is the one that all of you used when you were kids. You took the alphabet. You shifted it a certain amount. You shifted two letters. The key is two. You shifted four letters. The key is four. Pretty easy to break that because there are only 26 different keys you can use, and one of them is particularly boring. Um, you can have a slightly more interesting one in which you take the alphabet and you substitute. Maybe you substitute for A, a Q, for B, a T, for C, an L, and so on. The people who have worked in signals intelligence who are in the room will tell me that's not very hard to break either. All of you who play Scrabble will realize it's not very hard to break. Because, for example, in English, the letter E occurs 13% of the time. So you look for the letter in the message that occurs 13% of the time, or around that, that's probably an E. The next most frequent letter is a T. You can use frequency of letters. You can use frequency of digraphs, pairs of letters like TH, triples of letters, and so on. A trained cryptanalyst can look at a message 25 letters long and decrypt it. 
That's shorter than the substitution table. But I'm going afar. What I want to point out to you is the algorithm there is substitution. The key is the actual table, what A gets mapped to, what B gets mapped to, and so on. So, in a, so I was telling you about end-to-end -end encryption. End-to-end -end encryption is when we encrypt my communication from you to me, and uh, we're the only ones who are able to listen in, to understand anything. Anybody who listens in in the middle um, can't hear anything except white noise. Only if they're listening in to an extension of my phone. If they're listening in, you know, and they have a, a bug right by my phone, can they hear? Uh, that was the fight back in the 1970s. The more recent fight is about secured devices. They're also secured by encryption, but there the fight is about something else. It's being about being able to unlock the devices and get the data off of it. And that's actually a serious problem for law enforcement. It's not only that there's a wealth of data on the phone, but we've also transferred a lot of data that we used to have in other ways. You picked up a bad guy, and he had a sheet of paper in his pocket, and it was Chris and a phone number for Chris. Now that's on the phone. So not only is there a wealth of data on the phone, but there's some data that used to be available other ways that isn't. So as I said, communications is about end-to-end -end encryption. And there's a lot of different forms of end-to-end -end encryption. WhatsApp, which is a Facebook product, Signal, Telegram, and then phones, which are the fight is about locked devices. And there have actually been two crypto wars. My first book, written with wit, Diffie, um, came out during the, to the end of the crypto wars. And we like to feel that we were the ones who helped make it end. And then there's the second one, Going Dark. Now, the second one ended right when, the second one started right when the first one ended. So let me tell you, well, let me tell you a little bit about these two wars. Um, first crypto wars. The first, the first uh, fight was over publication of research. And in the 1970s, the NSA thought it owned publication of, it thought it owned cryptography. There hadn't been research in cryptography in the private sector and academia. But as people began thinking about the internet, and in particular, how would two people communicate securely over an insecure channel? I assume all of you know that the internet is insecure. Yeah. yeah. Right, you wouldn't be here otherwise. <laughs> um, so how do two people communicate securely? When you send your credit card over to Amazon, your credit card number over to Amazon, or your credit card over to L.L. Bean, how do you know that that's secure? Well, you had to set up some sort of encryption system that you exchanged a key that even if someone was eavesdropping, they couldn't figure out how to, how to decrypt your communication. That was research that occurred in the mid-1970s. Uh, a large piece of it was due to my co-author, Whit Diffie, the co-author of the first book. NSA, or some people, well, NSA said these, this publication is problematic. Maybe we should have prior restraint, all sorts of things. That battle ended in the late 70s or early 80s. And there's been actually a comfortable arrangement between the signals intelligence community and academic researchers. And they get along quite well these days. In the 1980s, the uh, fight was bureaucratic or uh, political. It was over whether the National Institute of Standards and Technology, then called uh, National Bureau of Standards, or NSA should control the development of standards for encryption um, for non-national security agencies. This is a Washington audience. You all know non-national security agencies and what that means. But why is that important? Because the standards that are used for encryption for non-national security agencies, of course, make their way into product, into product from Silicon Valley and elsewhere. Uh, Silicon Valley sells about 10%, or it did then, about 10% of its product to Washington. So any standard that was developed by, by the government and required as a federal information processing standard had to go into those machines in order to be able to sell it. Once it was in those machines, if the algorithms were good, if the algorithms were trusted, then other countries, other companies would use them. So whether it was designed by NSA or NIST was going to have very big impact into worldwide acceptance. The battle ended with NIST having control. Non-national security crypto standards are designed, or, or the, the, uh, the standards are d developed by NIST. The third battle was over export controls. And again, it's really nice to talk to a Washington audience because you get the arcana of all these issues. Export controls only control uh, what goes out of the country. But if you're uh, a Silicon Valley or any manufacturer, uh, if half your product goes outside the United States, um, if there's export controls on strong cryptography, cryptography that's hard for intelligence agencies to break, 
then you're not going to build two different products. It's very hard to say to Europe, oh, you get the weak crypto, we keep the strong crypto here. So the export controls had the effect of limiting the use of cryptography domestically. Um, and then FBI and NSA were largely aligned at that point on the issue. What happened in the, by the late 1990s is you have Klinger Cohn, which says the Department of Defense has to buy uh, military communications and computer equipment that um, off the shelf if they possibly can. Uh, you have the end of the Cold War and you also have the development of ad hoc military coalitions. If you go back to the first Gulf War, that's an ad hoc military coalition developed quickly with countries that may not be the US, fr US friends of the United States three or four years later as opposed to NATO. In NATO, you can take time, you can develop secure communication networks, systems, and you don't mind sharing it with close allies, the, the ideas you use behind developing the secure communications. But you don't want to do that with allies that are your allies one year and not the next. And so being able to buy commercial off-the-shelf equipment was actually pretty important. Export controls got, um, got largely removed in the late, uh, in, in 19, well, in 2000, and uh, NSA was behind this, FBI was pretty upset. So starting in 2000, the FBI began talking about going dark. And it's been talking about going dark ever since. And it says it can't do investigations because it has problems with getting the evidence, with understanding. So I want to talk to you a little bit about various investigations. That's a photo of Osama bin Laden's house in Abbottabad. One of the interesting things about that house, it was a half million dollar house in a country where a half million dollars goes a very long way. And it didn't have any communications systems going into it. No telephone, no internet. That's not proof that bin Laden was living there. That's not a way to find bin Laden. But once you're suspicious that bin Laden is there, that is one other piece of the proof that yes, it really is him. Um, I want to talk about a bombing plot that happened in the UK in 2005. So July 7th, 2005, four bombs went off, three on underground, one on a bus, um, caused a lot of deaths, caused a lot of injuries. Two weeks later, and, and the bombers themselves were killed. Two weeks later, there was an imitation plot. Um, and there were actually five bombs, but one got thrown into a park. The person involved just gave up and, and decided not to participate. The four bombs, again, three underground, one bus, the four bombs all went off, but only the first piece of it to ignite the bigger one, and then the bigger one didn't go off. So essentially, it was a bust. Um, the UK uses lots of closed circuit camera television to, to watch things. This is a legacy, this surveillance society that, that the UK has is a legacy of, of the Irish Troubles and has continued with, with many instantiations, including CCTV. They were able to pick up photos of, of the, the bombers um, and they posted those photos all across the press. And so people identified them. One of the bombers, dressed in a burqa, he was six foot something, dressed in a burqa, went to the bus station in London, went up to Birmingham in the burqa. Nobody ever noticed or paid attention to the six foot tall woman in a burqa. Um, when he got to Birmingham, he spent time in Birmingham, and then after a couple of days, he stopped wearing, he, he was outside in Birmingham without the burqa. His photos had been all over England, and he was identified. Another pair, one of them was recognized by a family member who told the police. The police figured out, you know, went to the apartment and arrested two of them. The third one was, uh, the fourth one was the most interesting. The fourth one fled to the south of England, then came back to London, got a passport from one relative, got a phone from another, and fled first to Paris and then to Milan and to Rome. The, pa the phone belonged to his brother or brother-in-law. The police were tracking it. They tracked the signal of the phone to Paris, to Milan, to Rome. They didn't think they were tracking him or they didn't know who they were tracking. They just found it interesting to track family members. They have the right to do that. They knew that a brother of one of the plotters was living in Rome. So they went to that brother's apartment and found their guy. Yeah. Now what's interesting about all of this is that if you had asked people 15 years ago, are you willing to carry a radio transmitter with you that reveals your, <laughs> your location at all times? Everybody would say, are you crazy? Um, I'd like to know how many people here do not carry a radio transmitter <laughs> with them. A handful, and it's pretty rare. Um, uh, 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 it's pr I'll leave it at that. <laughs> 
Let me tell you the, th the third case, which is actually to me the most fascinating. Again, it's an old case, but it's really quite amazing. Uh, Prime Minister, ex Prime Minister Harari uh, was assassinated in Lebanon when he was between times of, of, of of being prime minister. That is to say, he was out of office. He was expected to run again and win. Uh, and the way it happened, he'd been in an entourage. They'd stopped for a meeting. He was getting back in the car. And then he decided to stop and have coffee. And he, uh, they went and had coffee, started again. And then at some point along the journey, they got hit by a, a, a truck bomb. Uh, and there were no, uh, he didn't survive, obviously. Um, one of the investigators looking at the case decided, and this is early days, this is 13 years ago, decided to look at patterns of cell phone usage in Beirut that morning and discovered very interesting patterns and then, then did a pretty long study. The, the guy, by the way, was killed um, as he, uh, during the time of doing this investigation, but he'd uncovered enough that, um, that people were able to carry it on. And what he discovered is there were five group, four groups of phones, which he labeled red, yellow, blue, green, I think. The four groups of phones would talk with each, each group would talk within the color. The red phones would talk within the red, the blue within the blue, the green within the green. Um, the red phones, and I'm making this up because I don't remember which one did what, the red phones followed Harari. The green phone was with the, the group that, that had the truck bomb. I don't remember what the other two did. And there was communication between the different colors, but only one pair of phones communicated between the, uh, that is, only one phone from each group communicated with the others. The phones were not used for any personal calls. They were only used for this. A couple of exceptions, a couple of times, people broke tradecraft and did a call, which helped identify them later. The phones, uh, tracking the phones revealed where the truck was bought, which was, um, I don't remember which country, it was not in Lebanon. It essentially revealed the entire plot. Following the phones revealed the plot. Um, now I want to talk to you about yet another case. In 2007, the Security and Exchange Commission got a tip that there was insider training from the Galleon Group. Um, they did what the SEC always does. They start investigating at the low part and start building up. But they started talking to the head of uh, Galleon, uh, Rajaj Ratnam, and they did the, they, they conducted their initial interview the way they always do it, which is they ask an important question just before a bathroom break, just before you know, making it appear like it's completely unimportant. And they said to him, who's this Rami 81 that, that you've been, you know, they said, well, let's take a break. We've been working for a long time. Let's take a break. But who's this Rami 81 that you've been communicating with? He said, oh, Romy Khan. They went to Romy Khan. They already had evidence on Romy Khan, now that they knew who she was, of information she was handing to, to Rajaj uh, Ratnam. They got her to wear a wire. She taped him. Um, in the end, four years later, they had 35 convictions. He got an 11-year sentence. What was the important piece of evidence that worked? It was an instant message that said, do not buy this particular stock till I get guidance. Now, why am I mentioning this piece of evidence? Because if you go back 20 years, we not only didn't carry radio transmitters, our phone calls weren't recorded. We didn't send stuff, or most of us didn't send nearly as much stuff by, by email, and we didn't send instant messages. Well, our phone calls are still not recorded, but a lot of our communications go in ways where they remain. IM stays around unless you delete it faithfully each time. Um, that hadn't been deleted. So my point here is that there are various ways to do investigations. Um, there's no question that end-to-end -end encryption and locked phones make it harder for law enforcement. But there are alternative forms of investigation that haven't been fully explored or, or used as much as they should be. I want to talk to you a little bit about when things go wrong. And I want to talk to you about this movie, which I assume no one has ever seen. Uh, got a lot of publicity, but nobody saw it. <laughs> ah, OK, OK. <laughs> And what did you think? I, I loved it. <laughs> well, you should tell lots of people. It'll make Sony happy. Um, so what happens? Uh, around Thanksgiving, Sony executives get a message that you know, they have to do something, or they will be in lots of trouble. They ignore it. They get lots of spam. They pay no attention. And then somebody goes in and completely disconnects Sony from the world. The machines stop working. Email stops working. 
Email starts being posted, people's private emails. Uh, they made rude comments about Obama and other people. That gets posted. They made rude comments about other, about studio heads and actors and actresses. That gets commented, uh, posted publicly. Uh, films get, get released. Um, the North Koreans did it. How did the North Koreans do it? They did it in various ways. They got into systems at Sony and pulled uh, data off off machines that shouldn't have been on the machines. Um, they breached people's accounts. Um, so why do I have a picture of a phone up there? Because one of the things that Sony didn't do was have two-factor authentication on their accounts. How many of you know what two-factor authentication is? OK, so enough don't that I should talk about it. Two-factor authentication is the idea that you're going to have two different ways of identifying yourself. And they're not going to be on the same device. It might be a password and a little key that you stick into your, uh, to your computer. It might be a password and a piece of code that you get on your phone. And it has to come to your phone. Now, I will give you a piece of advice. Do not use SMS, for those of you who understand what I'm saying, do not use SMS as your second factor. Instead, download an app that does it. Somebody can ask me afterwards, but I'm not going to go so geeky here. Uh, so let me talk a little bit more about Sony and the mistakes Sony made. Sony didn't realize it was in the bits business. The financial industry year realized 40, 50 years ago that bits are money and that they have to protect bits. Sony, I think, still thought of films as something that you transport on canisters. They knew they sent it via bits. They knew it was bits. But they didn't realize that the bits themselves needed protection. Once you think about bits needing protection, you think about all sorts of things. Do the films need to lie on the corporate network? No. Very few people need access to the films themselves. That should be on a separate network that needs more authentication to get there. Once you think about the fact that bits are what you produce, then you think about the fact, how do I protect the bits? Sony didn't think second factor authentication. So I want to separate the issues and talk about end-to-end -end encryption and locked phones. And I want to tell you what happens if you make end-to-end -end encryption hard to use or impossible to use or you require that the, federal, that the government have what, what Comey and others have called exceptional access. So all of you have heard the term exceptional access? OK, I'll tell you what I think it means because it's never been fully defined. Um, law enforcement has been saying, we believe in encryption. We believe in security. We understand that messages have to be protected. But when law enforcement has a warrant, we ought to be able to get in. And we want exceptional access. Okay? We want so the encryption to be designed in a way uh, that, it's, uh, that, that there's access for law enforcement with a warrant. Uh, so now I, I take off this, I put on a t-shirt, I put on my pocket protector, and I start being an engineer for a little bit. And I tell you a little bit about the problems that exceptional access creates when you're talking about encrypting communications. Exceptional access breaks forward secrecy. You've no idea what I'm talking about. Um, so back in the Second World, let me tell you about one more encryption system. It is a perfect encryption system. It works flawlessly. It cannot be broken. It's called one-time pad. Suppose your message is just zeros and ones, long string of zeros and ones, and your key is also a long string of zeros and ones in some random order, the key. If you and I have the same key, I will encrypt the message by adding bit by bit the zero and the one, the zeros and ones in the two lists. So if, if you, the first bit of her message is a zero and the first one is mine is a zero, the sum is a zero. If it's a zero and a one, it's a one. If it's a one and a one, it's just adding one and one but gives you zero. She has the same key. She does the same thing again. For those of you who don't know two, uh, two, uh, uh, Z2, uh, if, for those of you who don't know the arithmetic, it's really trivial. She adds the key in. It gives her back the original message. What makes it work, what makes it work is the original message can look like anything given the key. The key can make it appear to be any message at all. It is a perfect system. The only problem with it is that we have to meet so that I give you, we both have the same key. Or there has to be a courier that gives us the same key. The Soviets were using during the Second World War one-time pads. And they had a little bit of trouble getting the keys around. So they reused some of them. That is the Venona project at NSA, which decrypted 
some of the Soviet communications. They kept the Soviet communications during the war. They, you know, they listened in on everything. They couldn't decrypt them. They didn't have the one-time pad. But then they figured out that the pads had been reused in occasional circumstances. That's how they uncovered uh, McLean and Burgess of the, the Cambridge Five. Very hard cryptoanalytic work done by the NSA. It's called Venona. You can go to the NSA website. Some of it is, is, is there. Forward secrecy breaks that idea. Forward secrecy says each message will have its own key. We talk right now by phone and encrypt. We use a, a key. Then I go do something else we call again later. We have a different key. I go to a website, and they protect the communication. They protect the communication. Every, every time you see an S in the HTTP header, it's a protected communication. It's end-to-end -end encrypted. But if I go to a site, and it uses the same key all the time, then somebody could be collecting the information. And then if at some point later they figure out the key, they can decrypt everything I've, they've read. But if we use forward secrecy and change the key with each communication, they may have saved everything. But now they have to figure out the key for each communication. It's much harder. Google, by the way, uses forward secrecy, which means that anybody listening into a communication you have with Google, whether it's Gmail or, or um, uh, Maps or uh, Search or whatever, there's a different key for each communication. Of course, Google itself stores the information that, that you've asked. So, so there's, but you're not trying to be secret to Google. You're only trying to be secret to whoever is eavesdropping. If you have exceptional access, you can't have forward secrecy. The two are incompatible because forward secrecy says new key each time. That means there has to be the key stored somewhere for someone else to use. It's no longer secret. Next problem is it breaks authenticated encryption. All of you know how poor software is. And there are lots of reasons why software is poor. There's the reason that, except, uh, that there's the rush to market. If you get to market before your competitor, you get a lot more co customers right at first, and you grow much faster. And often, especially in social networks and things where network, the size of the network matters, that's important. So there's a, an incentive to rush to market, grab customer attention. There's, an ins there's um, the fact that software itself is very hard to design. I'm teaching on Monday a class in which I talk about one system that's proved correct and another system that's proved correct. And the two were used together for 15 years before somebody noticed that there was a problem um, because the assumptions over here didn't match the assumptions over there. And, and, um, and, and nobody noticed that subtlety. Um, there are other reasons that uh, it's very hard to get software correct. It's in, in the case of encryption, the mathematics is very rarely incorrect. We have found very few instances where in a system that has been studied publicly for a while and then fielded, the mathematics falls apart. We found problems with the protocols, the implementations, and that includes that kind of picture I just did with my hands. And we found problems, of course, with the actual implementation, going from a protocol describing something to actually implementing it. Errors creep in. So one of the th ideas we've had in security over the last 20 years is the idea of authenticated encryption. I'm communicating with you. We want to authenticate so that I know I'm communicating with you, and you know you're communicating with me. That uses cryptography. But we also want to encrypt the communication. And one of the things we learned is if we combine those two operations, authentication and encryption, in one step using the same key, it actually simplifies things. The more simple you are, the more likely it is that the system will actually be correct, and there won't be errors in the implementation. But if you want exceptional access, you can't combine those two operations because you can't have authentication. Authentication, uh, if, if you let somebody know the authentication key, then you're letting lots of people pretend to be you in a communication. The most serious problem, however, is who holds the keys? Does Apple hold the keys? Does an agency of the federal government hold the keys? We had this argument 20 years ago. Some of you may remember the Clipper chip. Uh, the Clipper chip was a system proposed by the US government in which communications would be encrypted with an 80-bit key, and the keys would be held by agent, two agencies of the federal government. Um, it never got anywhere. Um, the US pro proposed it in, in, um, in uh, 1993, um, and uh, pushed it for a number of years and finally gave up in the late 90s. Uh, when I was writing the book with Diffie, uh, what happened, uh, well, let me back up a second. AT&T 
had been designing a system to encrypt telephone communications. When NSA found out about it, they said, don't use that system, which we would have trouble breaking. Use this system, um, where the keys are 80 bits, which is stronger than what, you're, what you had been doing, but the keys are stored with agencies of the federal government. So AT&T built a device to attach to a phone that people could use to do encrypted communications. Their market, their intended market was business people, especially business people traveling overseas, who were traveling somewhere where maybe foreign agents would listen into their communications and then share corporate information with their competitors. Um, so AT&T envisioned selling these things essentially in Radio Shack, and now I'm talking about two defunct companies. Uh, um, they envisioned selling it in Radio Shack. When Diffie and I were writing our book, I talked to AT&T. At that point, they had sold about 15,000 phones, secure phones, half of them to the FBI, the other half to uh, South America and the Mideast, uh, which is 15,000 is not Radio Shack sales. And, and I've just described a market that went nowhere. Um, so when you talk about holding the keys, holding the keys is the serious issue. And it certainly sunk Clipper. So why locked phones? Well, some of you will remember when smartphones came on the market, uh, the next thing that happened was muggings of phones. Knock a phone out of somebody's hand as the train is just, as the subway car is just, metro car, sorry, is just about to leave the station, uh, grab it and flee the car. And what uh, Apple did was put in an activation lock and find my iPhone, and the numbers went way down. Um, but there was theft of data from the phones. And that's more interesting and more subtle. Um, and so what happened there is that Chinese hackers, others too, but the Chinese are, are prominent in this particular story, found a way to get data off of stolen and lost phones. And they sold the data because the data was useful for committing other crimes. And they also sold their hack. They actually had videos of how to do their hack. You can't find them on YouTube anymore, but they, they did exist in the late 2000s. And so that was quite dangerous. It made the phones much less useful. One of the markets that Apple saw for its phones was used as a corporate phone. Many of you probably remember Blackberries. Uh, Blackberries don't exist anymore, essentially. And the reason they don't, the, the reason their market share has dropped, sorry? <laughs> Still a few, right. And more here than in any other part of the country. Uh, and I won't comment about why. <laughs> But, but the reason they disappeared is because the iPhones could take their place while also having apps. Um, and that was very useful. But if the data on the phones could be taken off, and if there were hacks that were being sold to take the data off the phones, then Apple saw a serious problem. Apple wanted those phones to go into the corporate market. So what Apple did is they figured out a way to entangle the user pin with a key on the phone to protect the data. First, they did email. And then the following year, they started protecting 95% of the data on the phone through a key uh, that entangled the pin with the device key. And that's why Apple went to securing the phones. Uh, it was not a Snowden response. The architecture and engineering happened uh, largely started, well, it all started well before Snowden. Not all of it was implemented before Snowden. It was a four or five year project. And it's still ongoing. Um, but that's why they were protecting the data on the phones. So why lock phones? Well, I've told you about Sony. And I told you about not using two-factor authentication. But now let me tell you a little bit more about why not using SMS. So for a long time, the model for a second factor was you got a message from the site to your phone that was a six-digit key, and you put that in the in the website you were trying to get to or the account you were trying to get to. Everybody following me on this? Good. Problem with that is you may be surprised to know that it's easy to get, sub to get a phone company to switch your phone number to another phone. You call up and you say, I lost my phone. I think, I think my kid took it and, and you know, then he took it with his friends and I've asked him but I can't get it back or my husband ran over the phone with the car and I'm so mad or whatever it is you say. Phone companies are remarkably good about pleasing their customers. And in this case, they're too good because people have their phone numbers switched to a new device. What that means is now the phone call, the SMS message is going not to you, but to somebody else. So here I have a case of a Black Lives Matter activist who all of a sudden he found his Twitter account tweeting very favorable comments about Donald Trump. 
Uh, <laughs> exactly. But a, uh, but a recent Times story described how this was happening to people who owned large amounts of money in Bitcoin. Because one of the things about Bitcoin is the transactions aren't reversible, unlike normal banking. So, so, and the way the second, the second factor was set up was through using SMS messaging. So what I'm going to tell you about now is a more, yeah? But if you don't use, if you don't get the message and you're expecting the message, then you know something's wrong. No, 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 no. What happens instead is somebody says, move this money. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, somebody has already stolen your password. So they have your password. They log into the account. They get the SMS message to, to they attempt, they have the two factors to log into your account. They log into your account and they do a transaction. Oh, I see. So the owner of the real phone doesn't even know what's happening. That's right. So the owner of the real phone starts not getting calls, starts having, being locked out of accounts and so on. But these guys are so fast um, that, that, and they may even have a team of people working to do it on various different accounts very quickly before the owner has a chance to respond. In the case of, of the Bitcoin in particular. So another way to do this, Another way to do this is to have an app on your phone. Duo makes an app, Google makes an app, there's an app called Authy. The app on your phone calculates something based on the time, uh, based on the device, and so on. Now, if somebody steals your phone and can get into your phone, then they can get the information on there. But the point is, if the phone itself is secure, that's one protection. The other protection is you know when your phone is taken. You don't know if your password is taken. You have no idea that your password is taken until an attack has occurred. Whereas if your phone is taken, you say, my phone is gone, I gotta do things. So the, the apps are a much more secure way of doing this. Um, NIST officially deprecated using SMS a, a year and a half ago. I've discovered looking at the NIST website that they felt deprecate was too strong a word and I'm not sure what they're using right now, but they certainly prefer apps to, uh, to using SMS. So now I want to come to something that came out um, a couple of uh, weeks ago. I was on a National Academy study called Decrypting the Encryption Debate. Uh, most of what we did, we did not say uh, encryption, uh, we did not say the FBI is wrong, we did not say the FBI is right. Uh, we said it's a complicated issue. Uh, it's certainly true that, that locked phones make life more difficult. There are other issues about locked phones that I'll talk about in a minute. We, mostly what we did is we provided a framework to lawmakers about how you look at the issues. What are the questions you have to ask if you're going to put legislation out? If there's an alternative system that allows exceptional access, how should it be designed? What will its costs be? How reliable will it be? What impact will it have on commerce? What will impact will it have on safety, on security? You also have to ask questions about can it work internationally? You guys are accustomed to taking your phones and using them in other countries. But if the U.S. has exceptional access and Germany has exceptional access, what happens to your phone as it crosses the border? All of a sudden, does, does the German government have access to the data on the phone? Not unless it's built in in some way, but there are a lot more countries than, than Germany. There are many countries. How do you do that? And we all know that complexity, uh, we all know in security that the more complex a system is, the more likely it is to have errors inside and flaws. Once it has vulnerabilities, it makes the system less secure. What I want to mention here in this particular thing is a statement that came out in the Academy study that said if smartphones are used to provide authentication codes, the kinds of codes I just described, in a multi-factor authentication scheme, then any exceptional access requirement to unlock smartphones increases risk that the authentication codes uh, could be obtained from a lost or stolen phone. And one of the reasons that's important to me, it was one of the things that I brought up, I didn't, couldn't bring this up obviously two years ago at the, at the hearing, the report is two weeks old, um, but second factor authentication is critically important for securing online accounts. I said at the hearing, and I can't give you more details than what I said at the hearing, but I said at the hearing that there are various government agencies who have operatives working overseas who use smartphones for their second factor authenticator. And they want to use smartphones, commercial smartphones, and not some special gadget because a special gadget marks them. A smartphone does not. 
So when we talk about this issue, we're not talking about security versus privacy. We're talking about different views of security, about security and uh, enabling invest investigations and security and securing our accounts and securing our identities. So I want to give you a short history lesson. And I want to talk about the Communications Act uh, uh, Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, CALEA, which was a law that was passed in 1994 when parts of Washington thought the digital move was be going to be towards digital telephony and didn't really see the internet coming. And the law was passed because the FBI was really worried about its ability to wiretap. And now when I describe the particular problem, kind of problem, it sounds arcane and sort of silly, but it's always hard to foretell to future, uh, future technology. The way a wiretap works, I mean, you've all seen the 1930s films or pictures of the 1930s films where somebody's standing with earphones in the basement of the apartment building. Um, by the 1970s, it had changed. And what uh, wiretapping consisted of was putting a tap on what's called the frame. The phone lines, the physical wires would come into the phone company, 6078, 6079, 6080, 6081, and you'd put a tap right there. By 1994, actually by the late 1980s, we had what was called advanced phone switching technology, call forwarding. It's hard to imagine that call forwarding was advanced, but in the late 1980s, it was advanced. And call forwarding means that the call doesn't go through the switch where the wiretap is. It stops at the switch and it goes somewhere else. And so the FBI was very concerned about these kinds of problems, and it said it wanted capability to wiretap built into the switch. Now, if you think about it for a moment, when you build capability to wiretap into a switch, you're potentially affecting the security of a lot of people, not just the person you're trying to tap. When the FBI got this bill passed, there was a lot of turmoil between them and the phone companies. Uh, there was $500 million set aside to update. That was well short of what was needed. There were lawsuits and so on. I want to go in a different direction which is that the FBI works with fellow law enforcement around the world. They convinced Europe to pass a similar requirement. And my history lesson concerns Greek Vodafone. Greek Vodafone had bought a switch from Ericsson. This is by now 2004. Greek Vodafone did not want wiretapping capability built into the switch. So the switch they bought didn't have wiretapping capability built in. Then the switch got updated because you know, it's electronic, updates come in over the wire, switch got updated, wiretapping capability got built in. But Greek Vodafone had not paid for the wiretapping capability. So the, voter, the, the wiretapping capability was not supposed to be turned on. And furthermore, any time you have a wiretap, you also have auditing capability built in. You have auditing built in so you can tell who's wiretapping, how long, what they're doing, get authentication, and so on. Well, Greek Vodafone had not paid for the wiretapping capability. So there was no auditing capability built into that switch. Somebody went in and turned on the wiretap. I don't know who. There are lots of suppositions. In fact, it may be that the first person who spoke in this series spoke about those. But, um, but uh, what we do know is 100 senior members of the Greek government were wiretapped between 2004 and 2005. Uh, the wiretap was shut off when, it, when the switch got updated and suddenly some SMS went awry um, and Greek Vodafone began investigating. The wiretap, everything stopped. But um, 100 senior members of the Greek government, the prime minister, the head of the Ministry of Defense, the head of the opposition party, the head of the Ministry of the Interior, um, 10 months. Uh, what was, uh, the messages were wiretapped and sent to 16 cell phones in Athens. Uh, I'm told that there are other instances of CALEA-like and CALEA capabilities being used to wiretap. And I was told I could say that during the hearing, but that if I was asked for details, to tell them to, to talk to the fort instead. <laughs> so I can't tell you either, because I don't know the details. But my point, however, is you build surveillance capability into infrastructure. You weaken infrastructure, security of infrastructure, and you, you create an opening for other people. So how would police investigate if end-to-end -end encryption and secure devices were, were by default, were the norm? Well, I talked to you some about metadata. Um, it turns out that the thing that bad guys do of hacking into your devices, the police and law enforcement can do too. 
What they can do is get a warrant, a warrant to get into your phone and figure out, or your laptop, and figure out which operating system you're running, which version of the operating system you're running, which applications you're running, which versions of the applications you're running, and then run it against a list to see if they have a vulnerability that they can then exploit to get further information off your device. They have to go back in with a second wa a warrant. It's never been fully worked out in court. If they need two warrants, they've been playing it carefully and doing exactly that. They've been doing it actually since the early 2000s. It's an expensive way to go. It's much more difficult than just straight wiretapping. Um, and often vulnerabilities get fixed. Um, sometimes they get fixed faster than, the, than law enforcement would like. Um, it is sometimes a one-off solution. Um, but it is a way to get in when content is really important. There's also many other ways to get information. I was talking to Palantir <coughs> in the course of writing this book. And um, one of the things that Palantir told me is that uh, they were working with law enforcement in a situation where law enforcement had a warrant to follow somebody. Um, so they were following them partially through automated license plate readers, partially uh, through cell towers, and in the process of following them, notice of course that that's much cheaper to do than, than doing it by having a team of detectives switching cars and, and team on all the time, much, much cheaper. Uh, in the course of doing that following, uh, they noticed that there was a second cell phone appearing in all the towers simultaneously. They found a second bad guy. This is the kind of use of technology that we didn't have 20 years ago. Our technology enables us to discover all sorts of things that, that wasn't possible to do or that was very expensive to do. Um, so how would police investigate in, in a period of going dark? They need to retool to become investigative agents, of, agents in the digital age. I've spent some time talking to law enforcement over the last, couple of, uh, last five years, and often I hear statements like, it's too hard. I heard a statement uh, a couple of years ago in which um, the law enforcement agent was saying, if we get the communications data, the two from who, what time a phone number was used from one company and we compare it with another company, they're in different formats. It's hard to use. That's the kind of computer science problem that when I mentioned to my class a couple of weeks ago and I had a group of undergraduate computer science majors, I said, how hard is it? They all grinned. And they all said, yeah, freshman, sophomore year. Um, I'm not trying to make fun of law enforcement because they're very dedicated people. They put their lives on the line. Um, there are a number of very high quality tech people in there. There simply aren't enough. They haven't done the retooling that they need to do. Um, um, assume that all investigations have a digital component and retool accordingly. One of the problems, um, and, and enhance corporate outreach to industry. I was in Silicon Valley a few weeks ago, and Silicon Valley told me about, uh, I'm not going to mention the company or, or the particular type of crime, but it's a crime that law enforcement talks about a lot as being of concern to them. And if there's encryption, they can't get at it. This company said to me, look, we can figure out some people are doing this crime because their communications pattern gives it away. In the same way that the communications pattern of the, the terrorist group around Harare said something funny was going on, if they had been looking for interesting communications patterns, they would have said, this is a funny pattern. This is not a startup or a rock band. This is a funny communications pattern. This company said, we can see this communications pattern is funny. And sometimes we go to law enforcement and they follow up. They, they start investigating, get enough inf information to be able to get a subpoena, a search warrant, and, and take, out, take out the problem, take out the, uh, you know, uh, investigate and, and, and prosecute. But sometimes we go to them, they say, we're too busy. It's exactly the same cases as law enforcement also says, we can't investigate. So there's a real problem here that when I say enhance corporate outreach to industry, enable, uh, uh, enable the, the outreach to actually net solutions. Um, when I talk about it's too hard, New York City has set up a digital forensics lab New York, uh, with 100 people. They did it a year and a half ago. That's great. They're investigating credit card for fraud. They're investigating all sorts of things. Uh, but New York City is one of our biggest cities in the country. New York can do it. Chicago can do it. Los Angeles can do it. Springfield, Mass can't do it. Charlottesville can't do it. I don't have to go through. Tampa can't do it. They're all too small. 
This is a problem that needs the feds to enable uh, uh, information sharing with state and local on a much better basis. Um, there is a little bit. Uh, there are the uh, so there is um, NDCAC, National Digital Assistance, blah, blah, um, that ch talks to them about this company does communications metadata that way, this company does it this way, this is how you request it, and so on. There's a regional, there are 15 regional computer forensics labs. They do about 6,000, uh, the 2016 report says they, do, they did 6,000 investigations which sound for, that helped state and local. That sounds great until you discover that there are 15,000 state and local police forces in the country. I don't have to do the arithmetic for you to figure out that's completely inadequate. Um, there needs to be much better capability sharing. There needs to be much more money. Crime has moved online, but our ways of doing investigation have not. And so my last point is more funding. Um, why encourage cryptography's use? Well, we have unpatched systems. We have long-term attacks from nation states. They're called advanced persistent threats. That was what went after OPM, Deloitte, and we have, of course, zero-day vulnerabilities. All of, none of these will, will uh, encryption fully solve or maybe even partially solve. Uh, if you have a vulnerability that the manufacturer doesn't know about, the bad guy is going to get in. But we have a different set of threats. And I want to talk to you first about ClimateGate briefly and then about our different set of threats. You probably don't remember in 2008, we actually believed in climate change. <laughs> um, I mean, that sounds, I didn't mean it as a joke. It was true. How, the House passed a major bill. And then what happened is there was a leak of mails from a research unit at East, East Anglia University in the UK. You guys all do email. You know how you're flippant, how you make sarcastic comments. Oh, maybe I'll spin it this way. When you know you have no intention of spinning it this way and you're going to tell the straight story. We're very casual in email. Um, the result was these mails were leaked. And, and uh, the UK papers had a field day, but so did the US papers. And they went around saying things like, look, these scientists are lying. They're exaggerating. They're making up, new, they're making up data. They're making up a story. By Two years later, 57% of Americans believed that climate change is real. There was, furthermore, there was a 9% drop in trust. Mm. Now, when we look at what's happening in the United States, I want to do one more example. And this is from Citizen Lab in, um, in Toronto. I want to show how reports can get tainted and then talk about the threats to the US. Citizen Lab is a group out of the University of Toronto, and they looked at something that happened to the American journalist David Satter. He was preparing a report for Radio Liberty. This group probably knows what Radio Liberty does. Yes? Yes? No. Radio Liberty broadcasts uh, news from the free world to the rest. <laughs> um, it's been around since the, uh, since the Cold War. Um, Satter was preparing a report on uh, Radio Liberty's investigative reporting, a hacker went in, some hackers went in, they took the report, they changed the report, so you can see the lines, this is all out of Citizen Lab, they changed the report so that it was not about Radio Liberty's investigative reporting, but about the US supporting investigative reporting by Russian activists. They made it appear that that's what Satter was doing. The point is not what is Satter doing. The point was that the Russian activists were now being funded by the Americans. That's a kiss of death for them in terms of their trustworthiness within Russia and the Russian population. These reports, these tainted reports, were then published on, on websites. The interesting part is the hackers were not as good as they should have been. So they had versions of the reports published. Um, how did they get into Satter's um, uh, email and accounts, the usual way, sending him a, a, a message that he clicked on a, a link by mistake and, and, and revealed you know, password and so on and so forth. This is the kind of disinformation attacks we're up against. Now, if I think about the ODNA report of a year ago, you guys probably focused on the, what it said about, we assess Russian intelligence collected against the US primary campaign. 
I focused on think tanks and lobbying groups viewed as likely to shape US policies. You guys work in a very rare, you live and work in a very rarefied place in the United States, and you have many more connections to the legislative process through neighbors, through friends, through work, and so on than most of us do. In democracies, civil society connects us to our legislators. In a, in a, uh, they tell us what the legislators are doing and its impact on us, and they transmit our ideas and our concerns back up. Some of us write to them, but more often it's done through something like Sierra Club or Greenpeace. There are various aspects to uh, civil society. American Cancer Society produces reports and advice. The National Academy of Sciences produces reports. The PTA uh, is an interface between parents and, and schools. Um, Southern Poverty Law Center, you know all of these. Now, if I think about Southern Poverty Law Center and Planned Parenthood, I have no doubt that they have set up their systems to secure themselves against attacks from enemies. But they're not thinking of attacks, they're thinking of attacks from right-wing people in the United States. They're not thinking of nation-state attacks from outside. Ditto for Sierra, well, for Sierra Club, Greenpeace, and so on. That's of course true. What's the effect? Suppose a report by the American Cancer Society is wrong by 10 or 20 percent on the incidence of cancer, or 50 percent on the incidence of cancer from a particular chemical. What happens to the trust in the American Cancer Society if it happens not once, but twice or three times? What about if some discussion in a committee report in the National Academy of Sciences is flippant in the same way that the Climate Gate report is flippant, or that the data in the report gets changed in the last copy before it comes out, and trust in the National Academy of Sciences go down. What happens, uh, you've seen the types of attacks against Planned Parenthood and the fake videos, but what if it's internal stuff that appears to be leaked and is done better than the tainted leaks one was done? So these are organizations, some of them have more money than others, but most civil society organizations run shoestring budgets and they don't have technical expertise. Is that something that, and I want to say the Soviets, even though I'm supposed to say the Russians, is that something that the, the Russians are liable to go up for and, and attack? If you go back and you look at the history of the Russian state, 1917, exactly that. They went after civil society because destroying civil society makes people uh, have to listen directly to the state. There's no barrier in between. You can think about the, the, the Soviet Union's response to Pope John Paul uh, because they knew that would affect politics in Poland substantially and, and did have a, a, a large impact. When, when the Soviet Union took over the satellite states in uh, Eastern Europe after the war, yes, they assassinated potential political leaders some of them immediately at the end of the war in the, in the two-year period right after. But the other thing they did is they went after civil society. They infiltrated civil society with communist leaders and essentially destroyed civil society so that they, there was a space for them to change the governments. And so, so we have a domestic threat here in addition to all the, the commercial and, and threats we've had in the past. Uh, the going dark debate is not about security versus privacy, even though that's the way the FBI has been framing it. It's really about the efficiency of law enforcement investigations versus personal business and national security. And so um, I think that there's a strong argument to be made that we haven't been supporting law enforcement in the way that we should. I don't think they've been asking for it. I don't think they've seen the digital revolution coming in the way that they should have. Uh, but I think that there does need to be substantially more funding there and training, and there's going to be a transition period that needs to happen. Uh, but when we think about the encryption debate, it's about efficiency of law enforcement investigations versus personal business and national security. It's really a debate about security versus security. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. I think people in mics are in charge of, of who's doing questions, so. Uh, could you address the um, reports on NBC last night that six states were penetrated, their, their ballots, their ele election systems were penetrated by the Russians in 2016? 
in the sense that if you think the law, law enforcement is fragmented, federal elections are 50 times replicated. Each system is different. Could you just address some of the... Sure. So I didn't see the report last night, so I can't address the report directly. The computer security community has been talking for a long time about the weaknesses of, of uh, the electoral system and not been getting any attention until about a year and a half ago. Uh, there are a lot of problems. Excuse me. One of them is that um, there isn't federal control. Of, of the states, of the voting system. It's done by the 50 states. Um, the companies that make the voting machines are, uh, do not follow good security practices. There's a pile of papers. I don't want to, I don't want to know, say how high, but it's, it's high on the, the vulnerabilities within the voting systems. My understanding, uh, so I, I didn't see last night's report, so I can't comment on that. My understanding, my worry right now would be more centered on the uh, voter registration lists and the attempt to manipulate uh, who comes to the to vote um, and and affect who is on the registration list because the registration lists are online. The machines themselves are not online, and that's partially because the computer security community has been fighting it for a long time and saying it's insecure. But I, I can't give more of a comment on that. Yet, do we have a serious insecurity there? Absolutely. I think the bigger insecurity is creating distrust in the voting system. And, and, and that's one of the pieces that the Russians are undoubtedly doing. Do you have an opinion on products, whether it's hardware or software, that are coming from China for the most part having back doors built in? <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> um, I mean, there's no question that they do. And testing these products is really hard. Um, and so it's a very nerve-wracking situation we're in. And I, um, this is not my expertise, so I, I probably should stop there. Um, we have found cases, well, I'll go on for a minute or two. <laughs> but um, we have found cases where they are calling home and saying things. Uh, I don't know what DOD is doing. Uh, I suspect it's not doing nearly enough in testing. Um, and we, we've gone from a situation, I mean, this is part of an economic issue, that we've gone to a situation where going digital made everything cheap. And we didn't consider the costs in terms of security. It's the same thing that we've done with the environment. We did certain kinds of, you know, certain kinds of mining, plant, uh, mining industrial processes that had long-term costs that we didn't think about. Some of them we're paying for now. Some of them we're not. And I think we have the same transition here. Uh, but w to the extent that we've lost the industrial base, that's seriously problematic. And I, I can't give you more detail. Hi. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this guy. I think he's a professor out of um, Silicon Valley who talked about the infapocalypse and how everything now that our reality is so influenced by um, like things like bots and how like on Twitter everything and Facebook everything your reality is kind of almost augmented and how that there will soon be like a re reality apathy. I wonder if you could comment on that at all. I don't know. C feel free to tell me I'm sure. not making uh, sense. So I, I only, my experience comes from the following. I worked at Google briefly, and uh, but uh, I live in Western Massachusetts. And I had got, I'd worked at Google for all of a week when I flew home for Jewish holidays and then went to, so I flew, saw my mother and then took the train up to New Haven where my husband picked me up. And as we're going out of the, the parking lot, he hands me a ticket and, give, and says, I think it's a couple of dollars. And I said, boy, I've been in California a week. Nobody would ever do it this way with a toll booth person and, and some money. Um, and that was, that was one shock. Now I, I, I teach in Tufts, and I, I split my life between these two places. Every morning that I'm in Western Mass, I take my dog for a walk in the woods. Um, I'm aware that Western Mass is really different from Boston, and that Boston is really different from Silicon Valley in terms of exactly the issue you're talking about. Uh, the, and um, I think it's seriously problematic, but I don't, I feel like it's outside my expertise to talk about it too much. Um, to the extent that the young people have their connections electronically instead of in person, 
Um, you're making little nods as I'm talking to you to tell me that I'm telling you the things that you're interested in. Uh, that's useful. I mean, if you think about when we sit in a car and we drive, we can drive perfectly safely talking to the person next to us as long as it's not an agitating conversation. We can't do that with a phone. There's a higher rate of accidents. Why? Because I'm not getting those little nods from you. Even though you're next to me in the car and I'm not really looking at you, I'm driving, I'm still picking up all the clues that we use. And to the extent that we're losing that personal connection, and especially the younger people, that's seriously problematic. But that's really how, how problematic, what the costs are, and so on, is more a sociological question than I feel equipped to answer. Thank you. Um, hi. I was wondering if you had any comments on the idea of police using parallel construction on cases, in the idea that they would, you know, they would acquire information by some illegal wiretapping and then, you know, arrange a convenient traffic stop or something like that, so they have a legitimate chain. Right, of right. So that happened actually in L.A. Um, a, a drug dealer got picked up. He made a left turn without a signal, and police popped open the truck and found drugs and discovered. And and his lawyer said. That's pretty unusual, and discovered that the Los Angeles police had been wiretapping for years before California had a state wiretap law. Um, I believe in rule of law. <laughs> uh, and when you talk about parallel construction, that's not rule of law. I don't think I have more to say. <laughs> Got one right here. Um, do I understand that you're suggesting that we not text um, directly through the text thing, but through a, a different app that you could get, for example, on Google? Um, you, you can, I tend to clean up my mail a lot because like everybody else, I tend to be flippant and then I say, oh God, what if somebody broke into my account um, and, and saw this? I don't want that there. Uh, my husband has a Gmail account and although it bothers me that all the mail is stored forever, when I write him, I, you know, if I want to send him mail, I have to send it to his Gmail account. Uh, so periodically I say, please delete this one right away and make market delete forever. We all make trade-offs about how we want to do things. Um, and I do certain trade-offs in using privacy protective technology because I teach privacy at Tufts and previously at Worcester Polytech. Um, and I, I don't think I can effectively teach it unless I also experience the pain involved. I delete things or I have things inaccessible because they've been private privatized in one way or another. I want to feel that pain to understand the trade-off. Um, you have to decide how important it is to you to protect things. I delete all my text messages automatically. I just, there's no reason for me to save them. I don't keep my phone calls. I don't record them. Um, so I just delete my text messages. I just use text messaging on the phone. I don't do anything fancy. But WhatsApp does it in a different way. So you could certainly use that. I, however, don't have a Facebook account, so I can't. <laughs> Hi. Uh, maybe this is not your area of expertise, but what, what do we do, especially living here in Washington, when we hear that, of course, the President of the United States denies that the Russians, uh, or maybe he's coming around recently, had a, and when they ask the head of U.S. Cyber Command testifying before Congress if he's been directed to look into the Russians' involvement, he said no. Yeah, I mean, that is way above my pay grade. And I was, I was really struck watching Rogers um, uh, because he was careful with his words, but his hands gave him away. The level of agitation in his hands was just extraordinary. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, it, but as I said, above my pay grade. <laughs> Stephen. Wonderful talk. One thing I've always wondered about in terms of voting if you have a ATM card from a bank, you can go to any branch and do business. But with voting, you still have to go to the, a single polling station. So why hasn't the, would voting be more secure if you, could, if you had the same kind of technology that ATMs have, or uh, even actually doing, be able to vote at uh, a, a AT, through an ATM network? So the Voting has this problem, uh, which is we don't want people to sell their votes. So we don't want people to be able to record their votes. We don't want a connection between the voter and their vote. And that's, what, that's the technical problem. 
between uh, behind voting and why voting is complicated. So all these moves like out in Oregon to vote by mail are great in one way and bad in another. <laughs> they're great because they encourage higher rates of voting and they're bad because it's easier to show your vote. And so that's the answer to your question. Thanks, I, can, I have two questions if I may. Um, um, the first is um, why does a vulnerability in a software lead to hacking? What, and, and the second one would be, um, I use Skype and I use text messaging. Are all these encrypted? Okay, so uh, why does a vulnerability? When there's a vulnerability, there's a way the program doesn't work right. Sometimes it can be exploited to make the program do something else. You can, you can for example, if the program has something called a buffer overflow, where a piece of content overwrites another piece. Sometimes you can then use that to give new instructions to the computer to do something it wasn't supposed to do. But it's, it's hard to explain without actually sitting down and showing you lots of examples. Encrypted. Um, it depends on which text messaging program you're using, and I'm not going to be able to tell you yes to this one and no to that one because I don't keep the list in my head. Skype is encrypted. It used to be long, long ago, before Skype was bought by Microsoft, that the communications were, um, went peer to peer. Now they're more centralized and more capable of being wiretapped. I don't know how Microsoft handles the keys. And so I can't tell you more about that. That's not public information. So a text message through Skype might be more secure than a text message through uh, the messaging. Again, uh, you know, so uh, there are various go-to places. Right now, Citizen Lab has set up a very nice website on what, what do you need to protect? Are you an average citizen? Are you a journalist? Are you a journalist working in a particular type of country that's more dangerous? Are you a human rights worker? What kind of devices do you use? Here's what you should do. And they are promising to keep it updated. The Electronic Frontier Foundation used to have such a site, but hasn't kept it updated. So I would go to Citizen Lab um, and look at what they've, they're suggesting. Um, I had a question related to the Harari uh, you said the, the guy that was investigating and found the pattern with the cell phones was killed. Was yes. that related to it his investigation? To it appears to be. The, uh, that whole story, um, the Times Mag New York Times Magazine had a wonderful description of it. It's called the Hezbollah connect Connection. Uh, two quick questions. Is uh, does U.S. Customs still have the right to require you to provide the password to open your phone or iPad when you come back into the country? And this happened a few years ago in Houston, as you may recall. And then second... Let me do the first one first. Sure. And then, okay. So they're not required to ask you for a password, they re but they are, they're not allowed to ask you for a password, as far as I know. They are allowed to ask you to open your laptop or cell phone, which is a, a slightly different statement. I don't think they can ask you for the password, up, but they are allowed to require you to open it. And that's because you have no Fourth Amendment protection outside the borders of the country. So I actually was coming from Vancouver down to Seattle by train 10 years ago. And uh, they, they asked me to open my laptop, and there's a file marked surveillance. And they said, why is that? And I said, that's what I do. I happen to have a copy of my previous book in my bag. Uh, but and they stopped there, but I always thought, gee, I would love to be able to tell this story in front of a good audience. You're the right audience. <laughs> um, there are bills up in Congress about not having that requirement, uh, but uh, as far as I know, it hasn't gone anywhere. So they can borrow your iPad or iPhone and take a picture of it and return it to you? That's right. That's okay. right. uh, I mean, there are things people talk about doing, moving all the data off the phone onto the cloud while you're crossing borders and so on and so forth. And the other point to make, of course, is if you're going outside the country, then there are places where you do not want to carry your own device. Mm -hmm. But that's a different question. And the second question is, is, is the banking system, is the electrical, uh, the electrical companies who control the grid taking steps to avoid cyber intrusion, which could disable them? Um, yes, and probably not enough. Uh, banking industry has been aware for 50 years that bits are money and they've worked to protect that. 
On the other hand, very weird story out of um, Indone uh, was it Indonesia a few years ago? Um, the SWIFT banking network is what enables uh, banks to transfer money across the world. And they have good security. They always assumed that the banks that were logging into them had good security at the logging in point. That the banks themselves had defined good security practices for connecting. Turned out not to be true. And so a bank in Bangladesh did not require second factor authentication. Uh, there was a whole series of transfers for huge millions of dollars um, over a weekend. Some of it got caught because there were misspellings, but I think there was $81 million transferred in Indonesia, of which they got back all but $16 million. Um, but that's when SWIFT said, wait a minute, in order to use the network, you also have to have secure authentication, which is defined by the following. But sort of they had viewed their role as just being the pipe, and they were going to have good security on the pipe, and not on how people connect to the pipe, assuming that the, the banks themselves would figure that out. Um, on the power grid, in December 2015, three Russian, uh, three or Ukrainian power distribution companies were attacked within a half hour of each other, and the power systems went down. They went down for about six hours, affecting a uh, quarter of a million people. Um, <coughs> what had happened, to the extent that we we're able to deconstruct it, is there'd been an attempted hacking of six power distribution companies in western Ukraine six months earlier. Uh, the usual kind of thing, somebody got a piece of mail, they clicked on an attachment that loaded down malware into the machine. The three power distribution companies that were attacked all had slightly different ways of doing power distribution. And so this was, when, when you talk about attacking the power grid, one of the things people will tell you about the power grid is, oh, you can't bring down the power grid easily. The power grid, um, you know, bringing down one company bringing down Sony is really different from doing a simultaneous attack that happens blah, blah, blah. But these three were brought down within a half hour. What appears to have happened is the, the hackers got in and then spent time experimenting elsewhere on the systems in order to be able to figure out how to bring them down within a half hour of each other. So we're talking about a place with not teenagers sitting on a bed playing on a laptop. We're talking about nation state capability, and we all know exactly which nation state it is. Um, and, um, and what happened is the, uh, they, uh, the second part of this story is, so the, the hackers got into the corporate network. There was not a required second factor authentication to get to the power distribution networks. They're, they're separate networks, but there's some links between them. But there was no requirement to do a second factor authentication to get to the, the important part. You shut down the corporate network, but shutting down the power distribution network is the important part. They didn't have that second factor authentication. That's the second fact out of the story that's important to know. Third fact out of the story is that the Ukrainians were then able to put the power back up within six hours because they had a lot of physical backup things. When the, the electric boxes got fried, they had other ways of getting to it. That was a message that DHS has very much taken to heart. Uh, at first they dismissed the attack and then they said, wait a minute, no, there's something serious and there's something we need to learn. So in the course of doing research for the book, uh, for listening in, um, I, I did some reading about power distribution companies and discovered um, that we have lots of large ones. But we also have lots of small ones. So for example, near me, there's the Holyoke Power Distribution Company with 17,000 customers. Can that one go down from an attack like this? I'm sure. But does it really matter? It matters to the 17,000 people in, in, in Holyoke. But it is not the same thing as bringing down the Northeast grid. So I would say that we have some lessons learned from Ukraine, but we're not as far along as we ought to be. But there's, there's actually, to get back in, in part to your question, uh, we haven't figured out how to respond to cyber attacks. We don't know what the right norms are. We don't know what the right responses are. And we haven't figured out how to respond to information warfare. Some of that is a problem that comes from the very top in, in terms of the last one and not recognizing that it is an attack or not being willing to admit it as an attack. But the rest of it is we haven't figured the other pieces out long before that. If one was to set up on a virtual private network, which I seem to see a lot more about, does that do anything to enhance? Sure. That, that protects you. So you're in a hotel, you're at a coffee house. It protects your communications from 
from you to wherever you're trying to go because you trust the, the endpoint of the virtual private network and that will then send you to where you want to go. It doesn't protect you against any hack at the other end. It doesn't protect you against a spear phishing attack and so on. It's one form of, because you'll get a, a piece of mail and you'll open it and so it's one form of protection and the problem is that there are various complexities and various types of attacks that you may suffer. Sorry, but the, the other part of it is trying to think about who your threats are. So for a long time I thought my threats were like many people in the room, not the people who've done intelligence work, not the people who've worked at state, but, but, um, but a normal person, normal citizen. I wrote a piece about the Russian hacks and, and, and them going after civil society. Before I did that I said to my husband, we need to change how we protect certain things. I think I've now elevated my level of, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm really important yet, but I think I've elevated. And I think that's partially, it's the answer that uh, when you live on a suburban street, you want your door lock to be as good as everybody else's, unless you have a Picasso on the wall. Uh, then, then it changes, your threat model changes. No, no. We, well, if you ask the Iranians, we certainly had intentionality in Stuxnet. Um, we have, uh, I was surprised when Obama described the Sony attack as a national security threat. It seemed to me, I mean, my goodness, they went after a movie company. How is that a national security threat? But when I thought about it more, I decided he'd made the right call because it was a nation state going against something within the United States, and that was the appropriate call. I don't know what we did in response. That was not made public. Um, we certainly, if you, if you listen to Cyber Command, we have great capability. If you look at the slides that Snowden disclosed and that others have disclosed since, we have great capabilities. I don't know how much we're choosing to use. I do know that our capabilities are one of the reasons we haven't been willing to sit down at the table and negotiate about what norms should be and so on. That's one set of things. But another set of things is information warfare is not something we've ever experienced before. And I, uh, this, pr this president complicates all of that discussion. But this president aside, the thinking hasn't happened before about how to handle it. And that's, comp you know, so, so we could say to the actors, um, we will view this as an act of war. We will view this as, as as threatening as going after critical infrastructure. But we have to make that leap, and we haven't done that. And that's aside, aside from recognizing it as a serious problem. It's, OK, it's a serious problem, but what is the right set of steps? What's the escalation dynamics that you do? We haven't done that either. Part of it is, um, if you think about cyber, uh, cyber did not make it onto the worldwide threat assessment and either until about 2010. And it's been at the top, so that's something that the U.S. does. Um, it's been at the top the last few years. So that means that uh, whether you talk about voting and the state election officials just didn't pay any attention to the issues that the computer scientists were raising for years. Or you talk about cyber as a threat, the political scientists weren't heavily involved until the last few years. And part of that discussion comes from political science. It's not a computer science discussion. And thinking about, well, how do you, how do you deal with this new kind of weapon, which is partially against the civilian infrastructure? Not civil infrastructure, but civilian infrastructure. All right, this is our last question. Oh, goodness, this is not as wise a question as some of the other. <laughs> it won't be that wise an answer either, so we're even. So you've mostly focused on smartphones as the access vehicle. Uh, I was recently on travel down in Texas, and someone broke in my car and stole my laptop. I had my smartphone in my own personal pocket. So the question to you is, what is the degree of vulnerability of laptops relative to what you've taught us today about smartphones? Just the same. And in fact, and iPads. <laughs> And iPads and all of them. And in fact, when you hear law enforcement talk, they will use the word mobile devices. And they want exceptional access to mobile devices. We all hear phones. They don't say phones. Mm -hmm. They say mobile devices. And they really mean laptops on down.
Mm -hmm. uh, but the vulnerability is the same. The difference is that we entrust different kinds of information to them. And laptops don't typically act as a second factor authenticator. So we have much more on the laptop, but it also doesn't act as a second factor authenticator, which would enable people to get into your accounts. And I'm sorry to leave you with such a dismal piece of information. <laughs> Susan, you are nothing that, that is dismal. You are a fascinating <laughs> storyteller. Thank you. Thank you.